I'm probably not the most peaceful hearted person in the whole world just because we are a little running, we're, we're jumping in our cars right after the service and driving down to Ipswich, Mass. So that's two and a half hours and we have to be there by three o'clock. So I'm doing that whole to-do list thing, right? I've got to-do lists in my head and I've got pieces of paper planted exactly where they need to be and everything zipped up and ready to go. Does that sound familiar to people with busy lives? So where in the middle of that is your peacefulness on this day of peace? And that's one of the reminders of our scripture this morning and of the time that we take in this season of preparation. I want to share with you thoughts about four kinds of peace that come in this season if we allow them and give space to them and work for them. The first is the challenge to have peace within you. There are readings that say that peace begins at home, and I would say it begins even more deeply and more closely than that, that peace begins here in your heart. We have these to-do lists, but perhaps what we need to have during this season is a to-be list, a chance to simply be. We are so busy putting out our energy in this season on our projects and our lists and our deadlines and our expectations that it's easy to forget to renew ourselves. That in a space of meditation and contemplation, a space of quiet, whether it's a quiet of walking someplace peaceful that reminds you that your feet are certainly planted on the earth, or the quiet of your eyes closed in a dim room watching the light through your eyelashes, or the quiet of prayer or the whisper of snow. This season is an invitation to be quiet with yourself in the ways that are yours to take care of yourself. Peace begins inside you, but peace promises connection. And so I would argue that the second kind of peace is a relational peace. It's a peace that moves into those connections that are important to you, your friends, your family. This is a season to think about and take care of those relationships. Just as the psalm is arguing for peace in the town of Jerusalem, peace in the temple, peace in the psalmist's community, we are people who tend to our relationships so that we can build and strengthen peace. But that's not always easy to do in a world that is fraught with violence, with oppression, with systems that are unequally set up so that some of us start out with different kinds of gifts and resources than others do. So we're asked to pay attention and to wake up once we've renewed ourselves and we have that energy to tend to our relationships. Sometimes it means reaching out where a relationship has faltered and is in need of repair. Sometimes it may mean actually letting go of or saying goodbye when a relationship is no longer healthy or a time has come and gone. And sometimes it's simply being present and maintaining a relationship that you too often overlook and take for granted. Sometimes the greatest love you can have is simply showing up. 
day by day, inside the relationships that will give you peace and will help others achieve their own peace. Our peace is also communal and creational in that we are responsible for the systems and the institutions that are part of our social time. The Psalms are a historic document. They talk about their own times and they were written by authors who were seeking very specific kinds of historic peace. Human beings are not born in a vacuum. Jesus wasn't born in a vacuum where there was magically nothing happening. There was Herod and wise men and there was a government that was oppressive in his time and he was born in a Jewish faith to impoverished parents. We are born in our own time and in our own place with our own identity. But we were born into a community and into connections. And we are responsible and accountable to those connections. So part of our being awake is to know who we are so that we can take care of the ways that we are responsible for celebrating what is going well in the world, but resisting and holding accountable those that are part of our system, part of our world, who need to also pay attention and do better. Yeah. Sometimes the amount of work that might be called upon for us to work towards peace in creation and community can feel so overwhelming that we're invited to return to that place of renewing the inner peace that is our first fire and our first flame. It's a balance of tension between the peace within you and the peace without. Feeding the fire of peace means finding your passion listening to the Spirit and letting the Spirit light you up. Things are more sustainable when you are passionate about them, when you love them, and when you are moved by them. And if it seems too overwhelming to try to create peace in the whole world, well, remember, you're not called to do that by yourself. We are all children of God and we come with our different gifts and strengths. And those gifts and strengths are put to the use of peace in the world together. And God and the Spirit are weaving them into a greater peace than we can even imagine. And that's the fourth kind of peace that we're invited to recall, which is the peace that passeth understanding. A peace the world cannot give. We can work towards a peace that we hope is an ideal peace, a political peace, or a communal peace, or a heart peace. But part of the stitching together of peace is that we are being moved by God, and move, God is moving through us and with us toward a time that we may not see, but that we hope for, for ourselves, or for our children, or for our children's children. We are called to be people of peace even if we all don't see the end of the peace in front of us. And we are called to do our part of peace, but not to imagine that we have to be the only instrument of peace. We are all instruments of peace. And so you are invited first to tend to flame within you, to light the candle of peace, to kindle the passion that is your passion, so that you have the energy and the inspiration to take care of one corner of the world. Last week we said that sometimes when you save one life, you save the world. If you create peace in one life, perhaps that's how you create peace in the world, or begin to create peace in the world. We don't know when 
and through whom or how Jesus will lead us. We know that Jesus is coming, at least metaphorically, every single year on December 25th. He seems to get born over and over again. I don't know if he ever gets older than one. Except that the Spirit and God were alive before Christ even walked as mortal flesh in our world. And the Spirit and God are here and Christ is with us and among us today too. In the very next chapter of Matthew, he talks about how when you feed the hungry, when you visit the prisoner, when you tend to the sick, when you clothe those who are cold or give shelter to those who do not have a home, who is it that you are meeting? You are meeting Emmanuel, God with us, God among us. If we don't know when Christ is coming or who Christ might be in our lives, then surely by being people of peace and tending to this world, when Christ meets us, we will be doing our best to be the people that are bringing peace to Christ and offering our part of what peace might look like, hoping that out of the brokenness of the peace that we offer, the wholeness of peace may arise. Today, to give myself courage, I'm going to offer you the song of peace. This is something my home minister, the one who sponsored me into ordination, and the one who will be preaching at my ordination service, usually does for her congregation. I usually don't do this, but we're going to give it a whirl, so just listen with kind ears. <laughs> Peace I leave with you, my friends. Peace the world cannot give. So let your joy be in. 